in the fourth quarter, <coughs> pardon me, in the fourth quarter of last year, we began a series, and you can you can start my clock. We began a series entitled Not From Around Here. And in that series, very important series, we learned God's purpose for creating the earth. It was and is God's intent that heaven be brought to the earth. Remember that? We also learned that we're ambassadors of heaven, ambassadors for Christ. And that we have three basic responsibilities, and I want to review those responsibilities. Number one, as an ambassador of heaven, our responsibility is to replicate the character of Jesus in our world and in our situation. And if you remember, we talked about the character of Jesus being the fruit of the Spirit, and we dealt with the fruit of the Spirit. We also learn that our responsibility as an ambassador of heaven is to reproduce the culture and values of heaven in the earth. And then we taught a series called Integrity, the Cornerstone Value of Heaven. Remember that? So that was a part of the twofold responsibility. But there's a third responsibility that we learn in that series, and that is, number one, number one, to demonstrate the power of heaven on the earth. Now, we're in that part right now, demonstrating the power of heaven in the earth. And there are four parts that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be talking about power from heaven. We're going to talk about language from heaven. We're going to talk about equipment from heaven. And we're going to talk about authority from heaven, those four areas. And today we're going to begin to talk about power from heaven. Come on, say power from heaven. Come on, say it one more time, power from heaven. We'll spend two lessons talking about this first part, power from heaven. The theme in this first part is walking in God's supernatural ability on the earth. Walking in God's supernatural ability on the earth. So today we'll talk about walking in the supernatural. Our background text is taken from Acts chapter 1 verse 8 in the New King James Version. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, but you shall receive Power. Come on, say power. But you shall receive power. Come on, say power. Now, I want you to put some emphasis on that. But you shall receive. Come on, put some emphasis. You shall receive what? You shall receive what? Now, notice it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon, upon you. Okay, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us when we are born again. But this text says that you shall receive, come on, what? Power. You'll receive what? Power. You'll receive what? Power. Come on, say it again. Power. Come on, say it one more time. Power. Come on, say it one more time. Power. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit who's in you come up on you. Are you following me? Now, let's, let's talk about two realms of existence. Two realms of existence or two realms of operating in the earth. There is first the natural realm. The natural realm. And then secondly, there is the supernatural realm. Realm, two realms of existence. Now, this is going to be very powerful. Oh, this is going to be just absolutely amazing. There are two realms of existence, two realms that we're called to operate in. That's the natural realm, and then there's the what? There's the what? 
and there's the what? There's the supernatural realm. Let's, let's look at these two realms. The, the natural realm, our background text for this is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 4. I read it from the New King James Version. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, mighty in God from the, for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, when we look at that third verse, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, in the New, Living Trans, the New English Translation, pardon me, it says, For though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards. Though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards. Now let's talk about the natural realm. Let's talk about uh, the, the importance of the natural realm. Let's talk about the power of the natural realm. The natural realm, watch this, is subject to natural laws. The natural realm is subject to natural laws. The law of physics, law of chemistry, the law of mathematics, the law of biology. So the realm that we mostly operate in is governed by natural laws. The natural realm, listen to me very carefully, because God is going to take us to another place. How many know it's time to go to another place? Okay, now listen at this. The natural realm is subject to the law of space, time, matter. The natural realm, thirdly, is subject to human reasoning. It's subject to human logic. Now, the, the natural realm, and, and God gave us an intellect so that we would, would discover and manipulate natural law. And because God gave us this incredible intellect, we have been able to use lo the laws of engineering and the laws of mathematics to construct huge skyscrapers. You walk downtown New York, and, and you can come up against a building. I love New York City. We, and, and you look, and, and when you're looking up, it, it looks as though you're looking miles up. That, that is the law of engineering and, and construction that has given man the capacity to create these huge buildings. And then there's the law of aerodynamics. Through the law of aerodynamics, we're able to enjoy space travel, air travel. Think about it. We can get on an airplane, and two, two hours or an hour later, we're in a whole different city because man has used his intellect, see, his intellect, to discover and manipulate uh, these natural laws. Now, watch this. The laws of medicine. Through the laws of medicine, we've been able to overcome certain diseases. And through the laws of medicine, we've been able, man has been able to engage in organ transplantation. Yeah. Take an organ uh, that is dysfunctional, an organ that is weak out of an individual, and then put in a functional organ. That, that's the discovery and the manipulation of natural law. And then there's the law of, of computer science and technology whereby you can be serving your country in a foreign land and be able to FaceTime your family. Yeah. Thousands of miles away. So we see that the, the intellect that God gave man was a part of the dominion mandate. You understand that? This was God that gave man the capacity to discover and manipulate natural law. You following me now? The problem, though, with, with this is that we have, we have become comfortable and dependent on natural laws. And see, these, there are certain limitations 
to these natural laws. Limitations from an intellectual standpoint, even the diseases that we're dealing with right now. Notice how much time is taking because we're working through natural laws, space and time, and, and these laws, and, and medicine is limited. There are certain conditions that medicine can't solve. Medical. Are you following me now? And, and the problem that we have is we become too comfortable and too dependent on natural laws. Even though God wanted us to exercise dominion and manipulate those laws, but he never intended for us to just operate on that level. So in Matthew chapter 14, now follow me, Matthew chapter 14, we see the convergence of the natural and the spiritual. Watch this, watch this, spiritual law and natural law. So Jesus feeds 5,000. So that, there's, with just a few loaves and a few fish, there's something supernatural going on there. And then he instructs his disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side while he sends the multitude away. He goes up in the mountains and prays, and he looks out and sees the disciples middle way of the lake, and they're working against the storm. Now, these disciples are operating through natural laws. There, there are some natural laws that enable the ship to stay afloat. Talk about those laws. The, the laws of physics and the law of flotation and the, the law of buoyancy keeps that boat up. But you can only put so many people because of the law of space. And it takes a while for the ship to get to the other side because of the laws of time. So they are working through these natural laws like we work through these natural laws. But we see the convergence of someone who's operating on, on a realm that's different than natural. So right in the middle of their situation, Jesus steps out and begins to walk on water. Now, now that's not natural because now what Jesus has done through a different realm of operation, Jesus has set aside the laws of physics, the law of flotation, the law of buoyancy, the law of, of, of density and mass, he just simply ignored it. And walked in another realm. And it was so unnatural that the disciples operating in the natural realm thought it was a ghost. Because they didn't understand the law of physics, but they did understand that it's impossible for a person to walk on water. But Jesus has set aside these laws, and he is walking in another realm. Unless we think it was just because he was the son of God, Peter looked out. And it's something about seeing somebody else walk in another realm. It creates an appetite and a desire for you to experience that same level. So Peter says, while everybody else is afraid on the boat, Peter said, Lord, if that's you, then bid me, give me permission. Let me walk in that realm. And Jesus said one word because there's a, there's a connection between the natural and the supernatural. And that connection is God's word and faith and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, come. And now we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about a man just like you. Just one word from God. Peter came out on the boat and began to walk on the water to go to Jesus. So we see the conversions of two realms. We see leaven operating by the natural realm, and we see Peter and Jesus operating on a whole different level. We, you and I, us as Christians, believers, we have been called to not just walk in the natural. He wants us to walk in the natural. He wants us to manipulate the laws of the natural. But we have been called to operate 
on a whole nother level. Do I have your attention? So let's talk about this supernatural level. Our background text is Acts chapter 2, verse 22 in the New King James Version. Peter here on the day of Pentecost is preaching a sermon after they've all, 120 have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he says something in his sermon very profound. In verse 22, he says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Now, I want you to look at this text. It, Peter is preaching to people, and he brings up Jesus. He says that Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested, the New King James Version says, attested by Signs, wonders, and miracles. The word attested, if you look up, it up in the uh, traditional King James, it means approved of God. If you study that word approved, it means accredited by God. It means to be recognized by God. It means to be given credentials by God. So the Bible says that Peter said on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this Jesus of Nazareth was attested by God, approved by God, accredited by God, given credentials by God, and then he lists the three credentials. He says miracles and wonders and signs. So Jesus had credentials, miracles, wonders, and signs. And when God created you, he didn't intend for you to operate on a natural level. The Bible says in the very beginning when he created man, remember he created man from the dust of the ground, from the earth, gave him a body so that he could contact this natural world, right? But he also gave him a soul a soul, his intellect, a profound intellect, so that he could discover and manipulate the natural laws. But he didn't stop there. He placed in man his spirit. The Bible says he breathed into man the breath of life, so God put himself in that man so that man could operate in two realms, the natural and the supernatural. Now, sin disrupted that, cut man's spirit off, left man only to the intellect and his body. So man can only operate so high. So even though we see these great marvels of engineering and technology and science, man is still operating far below the level that God intended. And I submit to you, even Christians are operating far below where God intended for us to operate. He intended for us to operate in the natural and the supernatural. Amen. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. If God gave Jesus credentials and Jesus needed credentials, not just the word. He didn't just pre preach. God gave Jesus credentials. So if we're just going to take the word and think that we can change the word without credentials. But Jesus needed credentials. Then we're, oper we, we're operating in a place that Jesus didn't even operate. Because Jesus had the word, but he also had credentials. And the Bible tells us what those credentials were. Those credentials were miracles and wonders and signs. Are you following me now? How many want some credentials? Now let's look at the credentials. The supernatural realm operates above and dominates the natural realm. That's what happened when Jesus walked on the water. He was operating above and dominating 
the natural realm. You're following me. The supernatural realm is the realm of miracles, wonders, and signs. Come on, say, miracles, wonders, and signs. Come on now, say it. Miracles, wonders, and signs. Come on, say it. Miracles, wonders, and signs. Now listen, a miracle is a supernatural event that cannot be explained by natural or scientific law. A wonder is something strange out of the ordinary that causes the beholder to marvel. And a sign is something visible or evident that gives grounds for believing in the existence and presence of God. Now, I want you to look at that, that, that third thing. A sign is something that's what? Something that's what? Now, remember, we're going out into the world, and the world need to see. You hear me? For us, we can hear, but the world needs to see. Come on, the world needs to what? See. The world needs to, that's why Jesus said, these signs. These what? Signs. Now watch this. A sign is something visible, evident, that gives grounds for believing in the existence and presence of God. Now, we are called, listen, <laughs> we are called to not just tell folk that Jesus is real and God is real. They can't see God. The world can't see God. So we're called to not just tell folk that God is real. We are called to give visible evidence of the presence of God because when they see us operating in miracles, signs, and wonders, they will know that's not us. God is calling us to a whole nother place now. He's calling. Now listen what he says. Let's go back to Acts 1.8. He says, but you shall receive. Come on, talk to me. You shall receive. 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 Now watch this. You shall receive power. The Greek word for power there is the word dunamis. The word dunamis means miraculous power. Miracle ability, supernatural enablement. You shall receive what? Power, miraculous power, miracle ability, supernatural enablement. It is God's will that every believer, every last one, how many of you believers? God has called every last one of you, every last, all of you watching online, though, every one of us to operate in the supernatural. I'm going to let that settle for just a second. You have been called to operate in the supernatural. Everybody operates in the natural. But we have been called to operate in both the natural and the supernatural. Now listen at this. Acts 1.8 proves it, but Notice Daniel 11.32. Daniel 11.32. It says, but the people that know their God. How many know God? It says, the people that know their God shall be strong and do what? Come on, say exploits. An exploit is a supernatural, miraculous demonstration of the power of God. The Bible says those who know their God shall do exploits. Miraculous, powerful demonstrations of the power of God. You're going somewhere else now. We've been around this mountain too long. It's time for us to go to another place. Now, listen at this. Jesus in John 14, 12, 
You know this text. You, you're, a Bible, uh, uh, you're a group of Bible students. You know what I'm getting ready to say. In John 14, 12, the New Living Translation, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. The same works. The same works. He's not talking about church attendance right now. He said the same works. Come on, say the same works. Come on, say the same works. What are you doing, Pastor? What are you doing? Why you have us quoting this and, and repeating after you? Because I'm shooting for mind renewal. And you understand that in a moment. Mind what? Same works. No excuses. No buts. No what ifs. The same works. The same works. Come on, say the same works. And greater. Why greater? Because it will be more of us doing the same works. And if more of us is doing the same works, then it's going to be greater works. Am I talking to anybody? So what happens, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon an individual? Let's do some witnesses from the Scripture. Let's look at Samson. In Judges 14, 6, the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, and he tore a lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. Though he had, he had what? No, it wasn't a pencil that he broke. It was a lion, a full-grown lion that's, more, that's strong and more powerful than a, and, than a human. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit came on him, he took the lion and tore it apart. What happens when the Holy Spirit comes on an individual? Let's look at King Saul in verse, uh, 1 Samuel 10, 6, verse 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 and verse 10. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. That's what Samuel told Saul. The Spirit of the Lord will come up on you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. When they come there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Now, Saul was a king. He had no prophetic call on his life. He had no prophetic bent, okay? But, but Samuel, I'm going to give you a sign. And this sign is that the Spirit of God is going to come on you, Saul, when you get with the prophets and you're going to prophesy and be turned into another man. When he met the prophets, the Holy Spirit came on him. He had no capacity to prophesy, but when the Spirit came on him, he began to prophesy. And the prophecy, listen now, because we're going somewhere. The prophecy was not a composition of his mind. It was not a composition of his intellect. It was a vocal miracle. He was speaking supernaturally beyond his intellect. But notice, it only happened happened after the Holy Spirit came on him. Now let's look at a third witness. Let's look at Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 46. It says the power of the Lord came on. Come on say on. Come on say up on. Come on say up on. The, the power of the Lord came on Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, the New Living Translation said that the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. Other translations said that the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he outran Ahab's chariot. Now, I need, I need to give you some context. I need to give you some context. From where Elijah was to Jezreel, was somewhere between 15 and 20 miles. 
Elijah, uh, Ahab got into his chariot and took off going to Jezreel. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit came on him. And even though Ahab had a, a lead on him, the Spirit of God came on him. And he ran 25 miles. And he got there before the chariot came on him. That's supernatural. How many know that's supernatural? Come on, that's a different real. Come on, say that's a different real. Come on, say that's a different real. Come on, say that's different. Come on, say that's different. Come on, say that's different. That's different, isn't it? That's different, isn't it? Then when we look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says he was baptized, and when he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Not a dove, but like a dove. And the Bible says he lightened or landed upon Jesus. Now, watch this. We have no recorded, documented miracles. No signs, no wonders of Jesus until the Holy Spirit came on him. And then the Bible says, watch this now, he went in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay. Where are you going with this? What are you saying with us? What are you saying, preacher? Come on now, bring it on home, preacher. Bring it on home, because I want some of this you're talking about. Yeah, bring it on home, preacher, because I, I, you, you done got me fired up. I'm ready to outrun a chair. You know? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to tear a line a piece. I'm, I'm ready, ready. Okay, 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 okay. Now, listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. I'm, I'm not going to say anything that's new. But I'm believing God that our minds will be renewed. You know what mind renewal is? Mind renewal is where you exchange your way of thinking for God's way of thinking. And once you exchange your way of thinking for God's way of thinking, you can live on another level. Okay, now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. The baptism... With the Holy Spirit, it's the doorway. What you said? I told you it wasn't going to be anything new. But listen, my renewal. Jesus said this in, in, um, in, in Matthew. He said, well, no, John the Baptist said this. He said, John, what well, Jesus did say this in Acts 1.5, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.5, watch it. Then he says, and you shall, verse 8, you shall receive, 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 you shall receive. Okay, let's add, you shall receive miracle power. You shall receive, you shall receive, come on, let's add, supernatural ability. You shall receive, you shall receive, and miracle, and supernatural, and miracle, and supernatural, and miracle, and you shall receive supernatural ability, miracle power. Come on, close your eyes. You shall receive supernatural and you shall receive and you shall receive and you shall receive. Now close your eyes and think about what you're saying. You shall receive. Come on, shout it out. You shall receive and you shall receive and you shall receive and okay 
So this baptism with the Holy Spirit is the doorway to supernatural ability and miracle power. Okay. I'm going to ask a question as I close. I'm going to ask a question. We, most of us know, and if you didn't know this, this baptism with the Holy Spirit, and we'll talk about it more next week, is an experience after you get saved, right? The Holy Spirit comes to live in you when you get saved. This baptism with the Spirit is after you get saved. And the Holy Spirit who's in you comes upon you and you will receive supernatural ability and miracle power. Right? Okay. The reason I went through that exercise with you and kept saying that because many, let's see, how many of you have been baptized with the Spirit? Okay. Many of us, unfortunate now, this is not a criticism. It's not a criticism. Don't hear criticism. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Many of us don't realize or have not realized, but you, you're realizing it today, that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a doorway For most of us, the baptism with the Holy Spirit has been an experience. I got it. See, I got it. I got the experience. For others of us, it's been an event that happened. Oh, I remember when I got baptized. For others, it was an emotion. I remember how I felt, because I remember I was in, uh, in my office at work on Berea College campus, and when I got filled with the Spirit reading the book, it felt like something came up and just grabbed my tongue and started talking. I remember that feeling. And then for others, it, the baptism with the Holy Spirit was a destination. I've arrived. But it's a doorway. Okay, watch this, watch this. You know what a doorway is? In my house, there's, we got upstairs, we got a, 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 a level here, basement level, and there are doorways. Upstairs, there are doorways into the bedroom. Downstairs, there's doorways into the kitchen. There's doorways into the den, doorways to the living area. Downstairs, there's the doorways to the activity area down there. There are doorways. No one wants the doorway. If you're going through the, going to the kitchen, you don't get to the doorway and say, you know, I have arrived because I'm in the doorway. No, you want the experience in the kitchen. There's something in the kitchen that the doorway gives you access to. You don't get to the doorway of your bedroom and say, listen, I'm here. Praise the Lord. I'm in the doorway of my bedroom. No, it's what's going mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. What's going on in the bedroom? See, your mind went somewhere else, didn't it? I was talking about rest. <laughs> but, but, but your mind went somewhere else. But, but, but think about it. The doorway to the bedroom, that's not the answer. The, the doorway is the access. The doorway to the den, you're not excited. I'm in the, who? I got it. Whoo, um, I got access to, no. It's the experience of going on the inside eating at the kitchen table, watching the television at the den, going to the game room, theater room, whatever it is, it's access. That's all the doorway is, is access. And we have stopped at the doorway. Oh 
And that's why some Christians say, well, I don't want to hear nothing about no Holy Spirit because I already got that. Oh, see, that's what I'm talking about. He said, you will receive power. Miracle work on the inside of the doorway is miracles and signs and wonders. Go on through the door. Don't stop at the doorway. Go on through the door, and you won't know whether you're inside until you see some miracles, signs, and wonders. So let me ask you a question. Have you gone through the door? Or did you just stop at the doorway? What, has it been an event or emotion, a destination? The doorway was a destination. Was it a feeling? Because if that's all it was... We've lost the purpose of the doorway. The doorway gave us access to this miracle lifestyle that God intends for us to live. And it's so much higher than the natural that people will begin to listen to us, but they have never experienced it on this level. You know what, Some, one thing I learned by my church, when y'all get quiet, <laughs> whenever the church get quiet, I know what's happening. I know, because I know you. I know you. I know you want everything God has. I know that. I know that about you. I've been with you long enough to know that your brain just clicking until you get over into miracles, signs, and wonders, we're just at the door. <laughs>